Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly podcast. The new season is upon us. Believe it or not, the English summer actually begins this Friday with all 18 counties in action. Today we preview the new county championship season. We look at what the future holds for the 18 counties beyond the 2024 summer. We talk about Ben Stokes' decision to miss the T20 World Cup and India have just unearthed maybe the most exciting young fast bowler of his generation. If you think that's over the top, go watch him bowl. I'm Yaz Rana, and with me today are Phil Walker and the author and journalist Ben Bloom, who's just released his new book, Batting for Time, The Fights to Keep English Cricket Alive. Great to have you on the show, Ben. Uh, looking forward to chatting about the book later in the show. But before we start, some important podcast news. On May the 9th, Thursday, May the 9th, we are holding another live show in London. This time it will be at the Hank and Ginger Cafe in Kennington Park, just a stone's throw away from the Oval. Tickets are 22 quid. There's a bar there. There's food. There's us. Uh, Butch will be there and there will be an announcement for another special guest in a week or so. Uh, the last one was really good fun. And I guess what I'll say is um, we don't record any of it. So it's unfiltered in a sense. Um, last time a member of the audience took Butch on in a live quiz at the end. Um, we'll have a and a thing at the end this time too. So lots of fun. Get involved. Anyway, here's Mark Butcher on the Ben Stokes news and the start of the English summer. Butch, the big news today was that Ben Stokes has ruled himself out of contention for the T20 World Cup. Matthew Mott was talking about him likely being available for selection just a couple of months ago. And um, what do you make of Stokes's decision and the thinking that's likely behind it? Yeah, I mean, the, the thinking behind it was was laid bare, laid stark by England's sort of lack of options in terms of, of putting out a balanced eleven in India, really. Um, much as we'd flagged up uh, towards the sort of like the latter stages of the previous 50 over World Cup, where it, it looked very unlikely that Stokes would be able to get his knee operated on and fit um, in order to, to play a full part in India. Um, that proved to be the case. Uh, and because of that, England, you know, at one point they had sort of three stroke four spinners and one seamer in one of the 11s. They went in with two and two at, at times, uh, none of which was particularly satisfactory, particularly as the pitches turned out um, to be much um, less sort of uh, raging Bunsen's than, than perhaps they had, they had anticipated, uh, at least beyond the first test match. So, look, it, 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 was, it was always something that he was going to have to find time to do. Um, uh, but I think it has been made more... Um, more pertinent and, and much more uh, sort of pressing in his mind and in England's mind that, that he is absolutely vital um, to them being able to field, field balanced teams um, during test matches, whether they be in England or anywhere else, obviously with the Ashes coming up as well in the, in, in the, in the winter. So um, he, still has the, he still has the ability and the desire to, to want to be an all-rounder. And that, I suppose, is, is a great thing. I don't suppose that comes as a shock to anybody. Uh, but he had to find time to... Uh, find the time to sort of to give himself the break to get himself ready to do that and and I think that the T20 World Cup is a good time for for it to happen because I think that there is also a slight feeling that perhaps his his best days as a T20 player are behind him um, despite the fact that of course in in big competitions in in big matches you'd want him around whenever you could but it caused England a lot of problems I think in the 50 over World Cup um just the fact that he was available to to be selected the way that Harry Brooks sort of found himself in and out of the team was largely because of Stokes' um, decision to come back for that 50 over World Cup. So perhaps, um, despite losing a player of his quality, it kind of gives gives England a little bit more clarity in terms of okay, well these are going to be our our most um, impactful batters in this in this uh, tournament, um, and we'll work out the the bowling ranks around that without mm. having Stokes kind of muddy the waters a little bit as he did the last time. Mm. No, it's a fair point. It, the, the England top six looks much easier to to predict now that Stokes is unavailable. Um, but it does mean that there's a there's a hole in the squad for a potential wild card um, to come in. So that's that top six is probably Butler, Salt, Jacks, Bairstow, Brook, Livingston, based on what England have selected recently. Darren Milan played a lot of T20 cricket for England in the last three four years, but it looks like England have moved on for, from him. At the moment, yeah, his form was, you know, was such that he, you know, he didn't command a sort of a, 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 an overseas spot in the in the recent PSL, and and I, you always got the feeling that he was slightly reluctantly selected in 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 place of in, in place of various others um, in the uh, in the in the fifty over World Cup, 
um, just gone as well. You know, he, he deserved to be picked in terms of his numbers, but there was there was something um, sort of unbalancing about his his style of play and the way that it perhaps perhaps affected the likes of uh, Bearstow or Roy had he been there or whatever it might have been. So again, it sort of clears the way for a little bit more um, dynamism. Yes, it, it leaves a deficit in terms of experience, um, but perhaps you know the, the time for England to move on from sort of 2019 and past lorries is now. And there are some very, very fine players. So Will Jacks, of course, you know, found himself with it, still finds himself without an England contract, but surely must be one of the sort of the guys for the future and for, for this format um, for England going forward. And it kind of paves the way for him to come in and play a full part. Mm. If they don't go back to Milan, do you have any names that you'd pick out for, for people England might look to who haven't previously been included in squads? <laughs> not not massively, no. I mean, I know that, um, and you mentioned this to me a couple of uh, a couple of days ago. But that Jamie Overton has been somebody who obviously is not sort of a top order batter, but somebody as a sort of an all rounder, somebody who might um, find his way as, as sort of a high strike rate, high impact batter, sort of in the latter stages of innings. You can also, um, you know, bowl a, bowl a couple of overs perhaps with the ball. Um, but beyond that, I think that the guys that are the guys that are in are the guys that are in. Um, and where England might find themselves sort of scrambling a little bit again for sort of like experience um, it, it is going to be in the bowling department. Mm. Um, you know, th- there are there are one or two fellas who are out there playing their trade in, in the IPL at the moment. One or two who stopped, um, d- w- w- took no harm whatsoever in, in the recent um, PSL as well. Um, people like Tamal Mills will always be, be considered. In fact, he's probably more considered now given given the sort of the holes that have been left behind. Topley becomes one of the more senior bowlers. Chris Jordan perhaps then starts to, to rise again as somebody who has that experience and also as a specialist at the death. Um, Luke Wood also did himself no uh, no harm in, in the PSL. So, you know, the, again, the way that the squad will probably look is going to be one where whereby there are some very familiar names in there. But in terms of overall tournament, um, experience might be a little bit on the lighter side than we've seen in, in the past. Mm. Um, your, your background doesn't exactly scream start of the county championship season, but we are only <laughs> tried, two days. I've away. tried to make it. I've tried to make it as grey as possible behind me here, but um, yeah. <laughs> Um, but we are only a couple of days away from the start of the 2024 county championship. Um, first up, who do you think is going to win it? Um, well, I mean, it, it's the million dollar question. I think you know, obviously, with with my old. Hat on, you'd, you'd love to see Surrey do it three out of three. It's it's something that hasn't been done since the 60s. It was Yorkshire in the 60s, was it? Post the sort of, you know, the the, the dominance of Surrey teams in the uh, in the 50s. So, you know, and, and they, they are in a position whereby they're going to have very, very strong team for, for much um, of the championship, for much of the sort of the early part of it anyway, um, with the likes of, of Pope um, being available for, for large swathes of it before England's test matches start. Uh, they've also recruited very, very well as, as they tend to do, which means that their bowling stocks are going to be are going to be unaffected by the comings and goings of overseas players um, and and call ups from elsewhere. So you know they're, they're going to be incredibly strong. I think you're looking at Durham actually. Durham look at having the likes of Scott Boland being around, Beddingham who's scoring mass scored massive amounts of runs and just recently played for South Africa. Um, Ackerman is a good signing from from Leicestershire for, in the batting side. Potts um, will will play a, play quite a large part in things as well, you would imagine. And the signing of Callum Parkinson as well, who I always thought is a tremendously underrated left arm spin bowler. Um, all in all, sort of gives them gives them a, a really exciting looking team. But we know how difficult it is for teams coming up to sort of perhaps get up to the pace of, of Division One cricket. Um, and and beyond that. Oof, I mean, I, I quite fancy the look of um, I quite fancy the look of Warwickshire. Um, Hampshire, of course, will will be fighting as well. They've done a similar thing in terms of you know the, with Abbott and um, and Abbas being around as overseas players as seam bowlers um, are, are going to be huge for them. Dawson, of course, has done wonders in 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 uh, in Hampshire colours for a long time now that he's sort of given up on his his England ambitions. Um, and and for them, it'll be a case of the likes of Vince and Co putting putting more consistent runs on the board and that might just tip them over the edge for the first time in God knows how long. But, um, you know, they, they, 
you know, they're Spursy, aren't they? They're, they're probably, you know, they'll get, they'll be somewhere there and thereabouts <laughs> by the end and then not get over the line. Um, and Warwickshire, perhaps, are the, the other tips for, for for being up there pushing Surrey very hard. But all in all, looking at sort of looking at the the uh, the way that the the fixtures have panned out, and the fact that you have um, a large amount of um, a large amount of Championship cricket before the Test matches start and, and before the hundred, um, I think it's going to be a, a very very tight Division One this year. And a, 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 given a good start, a bit of luck with the weather in the early part of the season, mm. um, you know, a lot of those teams in there would perhaps, and Kent fans are going to hate me for this, but we're perhaps the exception of of, of Kent. Um, might find themselves in, in a position where they might be able to, to carry it off. But Surrey are favourites for sure. Mm. Um, just on Surrey, um, Alex Stewart uh, is, is uh, using the line, we were good but not great last year. And that's describing a second back-to-back championship. Um, mm. In the last week or so, it was announced that uh, Stewart will step down from his role as director of cricket, sorry, at the end of 2024. Obviously, you 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 know Alec well. You played alongside him yeah. for England and Surrey for years and years and years. Um, his contribution to Surrey and county cricket more generally is is extraordinary. It is. I mean, you know, as a as a player, perhaps um, he was he was kind of one of one of the one of the big guys around around county cricket for a very very long time. But that was always sort of interspersed with with his ambition to be, you know, a great England player. Um, which undoubtedly he was. Um, he might have been an even better one if he hadn't keep, had to keep wicket for, for large parts of it of his career. Um, but I think I don't know. I think to, perhaps to the people of, of my vintage and and, uh, and guys perhaps even before me, um, the idea that he would become um, such a such a brilliant man manager, somebody that is is clearly revered by all of the young players that he's he's had the um, you know the 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 job of being in charge of at his time as director of cricket of Surrey, that would, might surprise one or two people because Alec was always, was always considered as a, a very single-minded, you know, his, his um, ambitions as, a, as an England player, whilst not overriding those as, of playing for Surrey, but they were always kind of, you know, uppermost. He was very, very sort of singular in terms of his, his vision. Um, but what he's done um, as, a, as a director of cricket, what he's done is sort of writing Surrey on, onto a path whereby they, they could become successful on a regular basis again, um, bringing through young players, having those young players sort of, you know, in tears at the thought that he wasn't going to be around is perhaps something that would surprise people from, from back then. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I can only say that he's, he's just, he's, he's somebody that constantly surprises you and has constantly, um, you know, had, had the best interests of Surrey at very much to his core. Uh, and, and is somebody that, um, People want what would have pigeonholed Alec in his playing days, I think. Um, but but I think he's very very hard man to do that to. He's 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 kind of proven that there is a hell of a lot more to him than sort of lining up all your kit in, in rows and and being uh, and being mm. Mr. Squeaky Clean of, of, of English cricket. I think he's, what he's done has been absolutely spectacular. Um, and I will tell him that to his face. Don't worry. <laughs> no, I, I find his, <laughs> his 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 role in English cricket over the last decade really interesting because. Um, I think it is relatively rare for players to have that sort of England career, to have a career, you know, roll your sleeves up, do the dirty work in county cricket for a really long period of time. And it's yeah. also in 20, 30 years time, I think we'll look back at this era as being a really significant one with so with so much changing. And, and he's been in a role where a lot's been changing very quickly. So one example, using this season example, um, Lancashire have lost Phil Salt and Luke Wood to the IPL last minute. Uh, the injuries went down the IPL. IPL franchise said we'll have them, and they went, uh, disrupting Lancashire's pre-season prep. Surrey can't do that. You can't do that if you're a Surrey player. If you're a Surrey player, you sign something that says, if you're not picked up by February 28th, you're not going. Um, mm. And that's not an ECB directive. That is a very in-house Surrey thing that the players are behind publicly, at least. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we, we talk a lot about the growing power of um franchise cricket and how it's taking over etc and i think you know that, that moves like that are quietly significant sort of showing that you know what if you want to have a you know he's also stood up for um counties in how they look after players you know if you're if you're a white ball only player um you can't expect everything from your county if you're only going to play 10 or so games for us 
a year. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like obviously he had an amazing playing career. He's done so much at Surrey. Yeah. Um, but I actually think longer term, we might look at his little period here, the director of cricket for a, for a team that um, is sort of at the forefront of the changing landscape of English cricket is quite a pivotal one. Yeah, and, and uh, that's an incredibly good point because actually, what 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 Alec has done is is entirely in keeping with his, um, with his sort of personal philosophy, really. In that, you know, if if you say if you say you're going to do a job or if you sign your name to to do X, then you are fully expected to carry that out. Um, and I think what he what he has done, or something that he's instilled in those in those young Surrey players, is this is the idea that that representing Surrey is. Is, uh, is is level to to representing England you know that having that sort of pride for for playing for the club um is something that a lot of the guys talk about and it, it, you don't it's not sort of badge kissing if, after after having signed the big check it's kind of something that they actually believe in hmm. um and you know he had that he had that grounding when you know he, he played a lot in in Australia in Perth in his formative years when he was breaking into Surrey teams in the 80s um, and he was always he was always very much enamoured of sort of like Australia's pride in in representing your your state, the bagging green, all of, all of those types of things. Um, and he and he's brought that into into a Surrey team in a very un um, in a very un um, sickly way, I think. You know, mm-hmm. in a way where, whereby sort of like the, the English uh, and their sense of humour and their dislike of of that kind of um, overt uh, emotion. Um, they've been able to sort of take it and run with it and believe it, um, and so you're absolutely right. It's it's been a it, it's been an incredible effort um, for him to to sort of to to bestride all of those different things, all of those uh, changes in in the game, and kind mm. of come out in front of them. Which mm. I, again, I don't think a lot of people would have given him the credit to have been able to have done, um, mm. having sort of known and played with him um, for all the years that they did. So you know, he's a, he's a man man of all seasons. Mm. Uh, you, you say un- unsickly. I'm sure there are lots of non sorry fans who probably do find it uh, <laughs> sickly to one. Well, no, but, but the thing is, I, mean, I know what you mean. Whole, I know the, what you mean. But the whole the whole idea of fandom is is that you you kind of you know you put your you put your club's badge in front of anybody else's. So I would find it a little bit odd if if fans of other clubs didn't didn't sort of look at that and think, well, that's exactly what we mean when we're mm. when we're um you know when we're sort of upset about our players choosing. One league, you know, the the CPL, for example, over representing our t- our club, you know, that that's exactly what they mean. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a bit of envy in there somewhere. Mm. Um, and and just finally, uh, a change for 2024. There'll be four rounds out of 14 that use the Kookaburra ball. Two in the early stages of the season, two in, in mid summer. Um, I was relatively surprised by this. I didn't think that the Kookaburra ball was a resounding success. Last year, mm. you you you've explained before that the properties of English pitches being different to Australian pitches actually means that it's not actually that good preparation for for what you're likely to find down under. No, and 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 I think a lot of the players, although they might not have had the same reasoning for it as that, felt that it kind of you know just disrupts a disrupts a um, you know the flow of the season um and, and forces you into into changing changing things changing teams changing selection changing whatever it might be in ways that you you know you really ought not to be forced to do um beyond the sort of you know the, the normal look at the conditions decide what's best um for for x game or y game but I, yeah I, I stand by that the, the the pitches in australia being incredibly abrasive incredibly hard tear balls to pieces whether they be jukes or kookaburras, and therefore the type of cricket that is played is, is very different. Um, mm. Pictures in England, particularly, you know, it, it, you're using them before um, before August, for example. Um, and if we have a particularly wet time of it, as we have done pretty much since the end of last summer, um, you know, those pitches, are, those, those balls are not going to get affected in the same way that a kookaburra would be if you were using it overseas in Australia or, or South Africa. And therefore the type of cricket doesn't, you know, you're not getting the benefit of learning how to play on a, on a different type of pitch with a different type of ball because the pitch is different. And so, therefore, I, I'm not I'm not wild about the idea. I, I don't I don't think it's going to I don't think it does what they think it's going to do. Um, it will change things for sure, but but not in a way that is going to help you when you go and play with a kookaburra ball in Australia. Hmm. Well, loads to look forward to in the early rounds. Cheers for your time, Butch. Catch you next week.
Right, the new season. Um, before we get into our predictions, Phil, it's just great that we're here. It's <laughs> April. Alive. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's always that expectation. Of course there is, but this... It feels particularly hard to rouse oneself when you look at the weather, right? You look at the weather across the country and it is quite hard. It, it's hard to fully get yourself going. It, it's hard as well not to not to let the mind wander to the, the sort of slightly quirky idiosyncrasies of, of our schedule whereby it's increasingly warm and balmy and sultry in late September, early October these days. Um, uh, but it remains pretty sturdily freezing cold um, and notably wet at the moment um, around around the country at the start of April. Nonetheless, this is this is what we've signed up to. This this is what we love. It's it's like a sort of like one of those sort of ultra marathon slogs and you've got to go through all four seasons. You've got to go through mud and shit and crap and all the rest of it to suddenly to finally eventually mm. get out the other side of it. Um look we're here at the Oval. Uh, we we do often mention that. So we we sound incredibly sort of self congratulatory when we say that, but I guess we are. We're very lucky, and so we've been we've been able to watch the champions uh, over the last two years go through their paces, and, and you're reminded yet again of just the the depth of their squad. Mm. And so we'll come to who's going to win the thing in a bit, probably. But uh, it's them, and then the rest. Um, which again sort of feeds us as well into much of, say, Ben's book as well. You know, the, the, uh, we're now starting to think about the county game properly. It's now in our in our it's now in our consciousness mm. properly. We're we're here. It's crept up on us a bit, but but on April the third, we are forty eight hours away from the first game. Um, mm. We're going to get some mad results in that first couple of weeks because some some games are going to be rained off. Some games are going to be played on puddings. Uh, some balls are going to madly refuse to swing because it's too cold and they're just rocks. Uh, and we'll have the Kookaburra instead of the Dukes as well, yeah, some of it. Yeah, and uh, and some balls are going to go around corners. So it's just going to be fascinating to watch. It's going to be some mad cricket over the next week or two. Um, ben, I don't know what your relationship uh, is like with, with county cricket, but um, there was a period a couple of years ago in, in the, the, the the glory years of, 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 the, of the Chris Silwood era where following a disastrous winter, There'd be so few test spots sewn up. This initial bit of the county summer would feel like this is a real opportunity for basically anyone to get into the side. It doesn't really feel like that anymore. And actually, the almost res- the reverse is true. And you look at the list of names who are involved at the start of the season, loads of the English test guys are actually going to play quite a significant amount of cricket. So there's quite a lot to be excited about at the start of the season. Yeah, definitely. If you look at Yorkshire, the fact that they're going to have Joe Root and Harry Brook... Um, one York, I spoke to a Yorkshire member recently, and actually he he suggested he wasn't very happy about that, which is, <laughs> which is a very uh, entrenched county <laughs> member way of looking at things. But yeah. um, his argument was that th- that well, Joe Root in particular had um, not turned out for them at certain key points in the past, and so it's not untrue. Yeah, uh, it, it's valid. Um, so he would rather Joe Root didn't play for them in mm. in April and May, which. You know, it, it's it's a fairly absurd um, county cricket way of thinking about one of the best cricketers on the mm. planet. Um, but yeah, you've got those guys um, turning out. I think the 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 bowling ranks is less certain, especially with the the seamers. Mm. Um, there's probably about six or eight seamers who think that if if they go well at the start of this season, then they could really um, get a place for the test summer. Ollie Robinson is one of the most interesting ones and he spoke um, very well at the Sussex Press Day. Were you there? Uh, this week. I wasn't there, no. Um, but I am a, uh, I'm outing myself here. I am a Sussex fan. Right. Um, so I sort of have a vested interest. So unlike that, um, that Yorkshire member, I'm very happy that Ollie Robinson, <laughs> um, if he were to be dropped by England, because he would then tear up the mm. uh, Division 2 for Sussex and I think it would help our promotion quest. That mm. that little anecdote about the Yorkshire member goes right to the heart of things, yeah. Because it's 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 all anti entertainment, isn't it? You know, you, you have you have the greatest player of, of our generation, perhaps the great most complete English batsman that we've ever seen, uh, ready and available to go, two days out from now. But because he's Joe is is, is representative of uh, a, a cricketer who is so much in demand that 
he's compromised in his commitments to the badge. And so therefore, a big black line is put through his name. Mm. By, and obviously, this is not echoed across the board. Of course, it's not. This is just one person's opinion. And you can kind of, if you shake the, move the thickets away, you can understand where he's coming from. And yet, it seems so sort of poignantly self-defeating, doesn't it? You know, we're, we're constantly desperately paranoid and anxious about how to present this game and how to move this game forward into in, into a, 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 sort of the modern sporting landscape. And then you have the chance of the best player in, in the game, you know, sticking the, sticking the, the white rose on his, on his chest. And for some, that idea is fundamentally anathema. It's, a, it's amazing. It's a case of careful what you wish for as well. Uh, Bang on. My, my favourite stat on this is that Sachin Tendulkar has more recently played in the Ranji Trophy than Virat Kohli. <laughs> so it is amazing that Joe Root wants to play... Mm. Relatively speaking, if you compare it to other countries in the world, wants to play this much of the season. And this in initial bit of the season, you're going to have... So I don't think Root's playing the first round of games, but he's playing the five that follow that. Brooks playing five of the opening six. Root's playing five of the, of the opening six. Stokes has essentially just pulled out the T20 World Cup to focus on his Red Bull. So he, he will definitely be involved. Anderson's going to be involved. Nathan Lyon, a bloke who's got 500 test wickets, is going to be in the same attack as the guy who's got 700. So there's going to be some serious class... Uh, Above almost the, the the county regulars, the guys who play a lot of international cricket, who we're used to seeing week in week out. Before I get bombarded, um, Root infamously missed that crucial game that Yorkshire needed to win in order to avoid relegation. They ended up losing that game, and they did go down. And those photos of Root playing, I think St Andrews or Troon or something like yeah. that, alongside Piers Morgan and probably Peterson or someone. You can understand, don't get mm, me wrong, mm. why why that it would stick in the craw a little bit. But I guess at the risk of being absolutely nailed all, all, already five minutes into the show, the macro question is mm. it, it taps into something there as well. Cool, uh, Ben. Who's who's going to win it? Who's going to win Div One? Oh, it's it's such a boring answer. <laughs> but are any of us going to say anyone other than Surrey? I think they're they're shorter price. They're they're less than two to one. Something like that. I think they're seven to four, mm. um, which is which is crazy odds um, in a ten-team league. But it it's reflective of their quality. They were they have strengthened from mm. last year, and they were so dominant. And they can put out a second team that could win uh, the title. Half the time they do put out second team because their first team's playing for England. Mm. Um, yeah, it's boring. I'm sorry, but. I, I would love to say someone else. I think it is going to be sorry. Mm. Phil, how do you see it? Well, obviously, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They've got 17 international seamers who sit on the bench. Uh, nonetheless, um, perhaps a more interesting question is, is w w where are the areas where they, they could mm. be slightly less than dominant? And you could, you could, thing, you could say, obviously, that it's going to be a very piecemeal team because of call-ups. You know, you see certain players, even in the IPL, who also wear a Surrey badge from time to time. You have, obviously, England players who are going to be coming in and out of the side. Ollie Pope, perhaps Ben Folkes. So it's going to be uh, a, dis a dislocated team at certain points. The opening bats went okay last year, but not great. And Rory Burns had a poor year for his, by his standards. Uh, he's, he's the skipper, of course. Uh, and runs the show here, but he will recognise he needs runs uh, because if he doesn't, there's plenty of other players who are desperate for that sort of slot. Um, Dom Sibley had a, had a decent year coming back, um, probably a net net win overall, but still, uh, if you can get them early, uh, you saw it last year that, that they won a number of sort of R snipper games. Yeah, I think they beat Somerset by three wickets in both home and away games. Uh, they beat Essex thanks to a stunner from Will Jacks, but Essex were up in that game and they stumbled over the line a little bit as well. They had the, the North Hans outplayed them in the in the final mm. stretch uh, and they limped over the line a little bit. So they're not completely impenetrable. They didn't win the league by that much, right? They, it's they not didn't. They, 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 they didn't. Away Nonetheless, uh, if you look at them player for player, then there's there's no there's no other team out there to compare. But if you look at them, if you look at the 11s, and a lot of this, much of this conversation 
sort of lives and dies by injuries as well, right? And and availability or otherwise of overseas players. You know, you've already seen that Nathan Lyon, who was down to play the whole summer, is now being pulled back just to, I think, playing seven games, so half the season rather than the full season. That is absolutely critical to their chances, you would think. Um, so, look, obviously sorry, but behind them, I fancy Hampshire, who have done well in the last three years. I think they've finished in the top three in the last three years. Uh, they've signed Ali Orr from Sussex, who's a good top-order player. I like Fletcher Middleton as well, who's a, who's a top-order opener, who's not got a great record, but I think he's due a good year, due a breakout year. I think he's got a lot of talent. They underperformed in their middle order, really. Um, Vince, I think, was the only one to make, to average 40-plus or to make 800-plus yeah, only, only three of them averaged more than 30. There you go, year. right. Nick Gubbins is in there, but again, he's a good player. He's a good player. Uh, so... If their top five can click better than it did last year, mm. then they have the bowling attack to to take 20 wickets comfortably in Barker, in Abbas, in uh, Kyle Abbott, and in John Turner as well, who, you know, becoming sort of breakout stars in a bit. He's, he's one name that you throw into the mix. You know, he's mm. quick, tall, athletic, very unproven, but England like him, sniffing around him already. So Hampshire, perhaps, mm. uh, I don't see... Lancashire are not really having enough seam bowling depth, but again, you know, injuries and such, if you have a clear run, if Saki Mahmood comes back and plays some four-day cricket, we spoke about him mm. the other week with Keaton, but look, it's hard, it's hard. Mm. I don't see Essex having enough. They finished second last year and pushed Surrey well throughout the year. I don't really see them having enough this time round. So it's, it's Surrey and, uh, but I would go with Hampshire. Uh, ben, who do you think is most likely to challenge Surrey if Surrey are the number one? Uh, I, I was going to go with Hampshire as well. Sorry. Um, no, no. You be you. <laughs> well, it looks like I'm not being me and I'm just being a replica of you. Um, yeah, the, the, the Don't same... Don't ever do that. Trust me. <laughs> the same reasons that you said, really. I, I guess the only... I, I don't know how much they can challenge because that, that seam bowling attack is brilliant. We know it's brilliant in, in the counter championship. They are getting older. They're now getting mm. to the true. point where they are. Uh, their age is going to start counting against That's them. That's true. That might sound ludicrous when you have James Anderson doing what he's doing at significantly older age. Um, but he's a freak. Uh, so those guys, those three that you mentioned, they're all they're all getting old. And you mentioned injuries. Um, can they last the season? Mm. No, it's, 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 it's a really good point. I think a, a broader point around this summer, I feel like more than usual counties have um, prioritised availability with overseas players. So I think one of the reasons why Lancashire will privately be pretty pissed off about the Lion News is that they did very well to get a player, not only that good, but that good who is available in theory for the entirety of the summer. Oh, be, not that I've heard anything, but they will be seething with yeah, that. Yeah, 100%. And also for you that think, to you happen think the so work late. You have to do to yeah. get that signing over the line and then you have to through gritted teeth, put out a press release saying, you know, we we respect and understand yeah. Cricket Australia's <laughs> wishes. It's hard. It's hard to stomach that one, I think. Yeah. And, the, and also, the, if you the, look at, sorry, sorry, if you look at Lancashire's other overseas player, it's a guy that I think most people wouldn't have heard of. It's a guy called Tom Bruce, mm. who's a New Zealander with an outstanding first class record, but he's never played for New Zealand. He's around all season and there are a couple of other overseas signings who might initially look like, well, I, I've not heard of them. I've not seen them play international cricket. But if they're available all summer, uh, across all formats, that is that is really valuable for a county, um, and it feels like that's been prioritised more than usual. Um, so I think, I think, yeah, a link with that is is fitness. You know, if you mm. look at some someone like Hampshire, I think you're right that that attack is, uh, you know, Abbott and Barker. I, I would think you'd, you'd say you could see they are not quite the bowlers they were a few years ago. So another year, how they go will be really interesting. With Essex, I I sort of think they're always in it. If you've got Cook, Porter, Harmer. I'm not even sure who that who that fourth bowler will be, who that third team will be this season. You're always in with a shout, and you're it's, right. And but, it's but, not but, as if that Cook and Lawrence had outstanding years last year, and they brought in Dean Elgar and Jordan Cox, who was close to like for like replacements as you can get. Really, that, that that's all fair. But there, are, and obviously, I follow this one quite closely. The fact that you don't know who that third seamer is in itself mm. t is quite telling. Shane Snate has done okay. He's done well actually, um, but again, you know, he's a sort of industrious sort of county cricketer. Uh, the opening bat uh, alongside Elgar is a big question for Essex. So I saw that 
uh, Cushy, Feroz Cushy opened in the warm-up game this week. Nick Brown has done the job before, uh, but struggled for the last two years, not really made the runs that you need to at the top division, opening the, bats, opening the batting. So I wonder if they might take a punt on Cushy, which would be a big gamble. Uh, Tom Wesley's a quality player at three, but he's a very sort of streaky player. He has good good months and bad months and good years and bad years, probably like most county cricketers, to be fair. Uh, sure, Lawrence Cox as a, as a Lawrence replacement looks like a like-for-like, like, but you're still having to readjust. You know, you're still having to go again. It might be that he's becomes an even better player, or it might be that he takes a bit of time. So there's no there's question marks over who keeps wicket there. It was Rossington before. Will it be Cox this time round? I think I think it's too much for Essex really to to bother Surrey, but you never know. You never know. The cl- the club we haven't mentioned is Durham. Mm. So how do you see them? I I um was or am astonished to see that they're eighth in the odds um of the You're eighth. They're eighth of the ten. Um, wow. I can't really understand why. Uh, they're unlikely to win the thing. Let's be realistic, but. I, I don't think they're going to go down. I don't mm. think they're going to be close to going down, really. Um, I think this is a really interesting thing to the extent that I'm literally going to put some money on this. <laughs> so thanks for alarming me. Do we, you, we can talk websites after the show. <laughs> there's also, there's, I, I don't know which bookie, um, but one bookie at least is doing um, a market without Surrey. Um, oh, wow. And, uh, and Durham are seventh. I don't know what the odds we, we are. We talk in depth yeah. after the show. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I need I, names, I so need reports. I think both those two, two things are fascinating. Surrey are favourites, rightly so. But I'll stress again, they struggle with availability at points in the in the summer. So someone like Will Jacks, if you look at the calendar, and uh, if you want to have a look at the calendar, remember, get the Wisdom Cricket Monthly oh, World Chart. good. That's good. That's um, good. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you look at the calendar this year, England availability is different to normal. So if you're a if you're an IPL white ball England player, you might only play three rounds all summer. And Will Jacks is someone who's played a fair bit of for the, for them in in both their recent county championship wins. Someone like Sam Curran is unlikely to play at all. Uh, it might mean that someone like Ollie Pope is available more, but um, availability is a little bit different to how it's been the last couple of years. Durham, I think, are fascinating because. They destroyed Division 2 last year. They've recruited really well. So they've got Callum mm. Parkinson in from Leicestershire. And they've also got Colin Ackerman in from Leicestershire. Um, with Ackerman, they now have they have nine players who averaged more than 40 with the bat in Div 2 last year. Um, and they've got Scott Boland in for the first nine games of the season. Totally. Scott Boland is almost a dream county signing. And that means they have an attack of Boland Potts, who had an amazing winter with the Lions and is cleaned up in Div 2 two years in a row. Ben Rain, who has been around for years and always takes wickets. Bryden Cass, Mark Wood. That is one hell of an attack. And also, and I'm, I don't think Warwickshire are really in with much of a shout because I think that they're short on batting. But Durham, Surrey and Warwickshire, I'd say stand out as, as, as teams who have enough bowling to rotate their main guys so they're always fresh in that initial eight-game burst Indeed. at the start of the season. Warwickshire, by the way, Wokes, Hassan Ali, Hannan Dalby, Rushworth, Norwell, plus a couple of others. So, yeah, I, I, I think Durham are the real wild, wild card. Like, obviously, not all nine of those guys who did well in Div 2 last year are going to do well this year. But there, there are the guys that England are looking at. Alex Lee still plays for the Lions. Ollie Robinson plays for the Lions. Beddingham's played for South Africa. Borthwick's you know, excellent player for a number of years. So I'm fascinated by how Durham go because I, I think they've got the bowling attack. Bowling attacks win your championships and that is a bowling attack that is as good as any. But, you, but also, you're bang on. Uh, but the other thing that wins your championships is a is a rock-solid opening bat and a middle-order engine room. And Beddingham is an international-class player and we saw that over the winter. And Ollie Robinson's probably the best uh, keeper bat that's not yet played for England. Probably the most... A developed keeper bat that's not yet played mm. any, anything for England. They're your engine room positions, obviously, and, and then you see attack wins wins championships. So they are a fascinating option. They might be seventh or eighth or whatever in the bookies. We will come back to that. Uh, but they're second in WCM's predictions. So there you go. Mm. There so you either go. they're right, the bookies, or, or Joe and me are right. Um, mm. We shall see. But um, they are a fascinating unknown quantity in all of this. And I guess by... Having not mentioned them already, the likes of Somerset, Worcester and Kent, you'd imagine are likely to be fighting it out at the bottom. Two teams go down. Obviously, Worcester finished second in Div 2 last year and lost their three most exciting young players all to knots. Um, 
and Somerset have been short on batting for a couple of years now and Kent only just stayed up last year and are, are probably short on, on domestic seam talent. Yeah, um, so so uh, Joe Leach, who's you know, a sort of talismanic figure, I guess, at Worcester these days, said, look, if we finish one point above the relegation zone, then it's, it's a really great result for mm. us across the season. Uh, they've signed Jason Holder this week, I mm. noticed, which mm. is, I mean, he might win them two games in the first three out of nowhere. Uh, just be unplayable mm. um, at Kidderminster, where they have to play because, yet again, New Road is submerged. Mm. Uh, I have them to go down, unfortunately. But, again, it's it's a wild league. It's always been a wild league. What's mm. interesting about the Surrey story is that we, ha- we now have a team that is uh, unquestionably the dominant force in, in that top league. And we haven't really, we haven't had that. We haven't had that at all. There hasn't been a dominant figure uh throughout really the last 10 15 years you know it's been shared around and teams who you think are going to go well get relegated and mm. teams that you think are going to get relegated I guess Yorkshire the, the top re- echelon. briefly threatened to do that um before they lost their best players to England yeah York, Yorkshire won a couple mm. um sorry of course only won the one before the turn of the century um before this recent mm. mini run uh two in a row obviously Essex won it Three times. If you include the Bob Willis, yeah. You include the Bob Willis, so two and a half times. Yeah. Uh, I remember we talked about it at the time and you said, you know, I think Essex might be at the start of a dynasty and, mm. and I, I said, well, County Champion doesn't really play like that mm. so much anymore. Um, it would be good for the tournament if Surrey don't want to run away for, for it, for, with it rather, because we are, we're talking around the edges of two-tiered county setups and all of that. We'll probably come to that, but obviously a juggernaut at the top while fair play to Surrey, the canniest and most pragmatically run co- club in the country, it's not great for the the sheen of the tournament mm. and its sort of innate unpredictability. The other team I had, I think the only team we've not mentioned at all are not. So I, oh, I think they're quite interesting because a lot of big name batters, uh, relatively quiet last season. Hamid, uh, average under 30, I think. Duckett should be available for a fair bit of the early season. They recruited well. Uh, Will Young, the New Zealand player, he's in for a fair bit of the opening burst of the season. Jack Haynes is a player that a lot of people rate. He, he's moved from Worcestershire. Uh, Lyndon James has played for the Lions and they've got a really good bowling attack, although um, we don't know how fit Josh Tung is at this point in time. Dylan Pennington is the other one they signed from Worcestershire. Um, let's let's go on to individuals. Um, ben, who's who's your breakout star of, of the 2024 summer? Well, I've written his name down and then thought, I don't know if this is legit because he's an England international. But his, his two international caps are basically fake because they were against Ireland last year when it was a second string team. So I've written down Jamie Smith because it feels like this could be the year that he goes from uh, you know bright future, potential, all of those types of words to come whatever point in the season. Mm. Wow. England are really going to have to think about picking this guy now, aren't they? Um, yeah, he he, um, he played those two games against Ireland. Let's let's discount that because you probably can't be a breakout star if you're an international. So we'll ignore those. Um, he he went to the ILT20 over the winter instead of um, playing England Lions, and said he spoke to the whole England setup and they um, agreed with his decision. It, he wants to. He did it because he wants to be a three-format um, all-round player. He didn't perform brilliantly, um, but at least it shows the ambition. Um, he, he's really looking to be a fully rounded player. He looks like he's got a hell of a lot of attributes. Mm. Um, yeah, we'll see. He, he should get a lot of game time um, because sorry, sorry, have to chop and change all sorts. Um, whether he gets the gloves at any point remains to be seen. We'll see what happens with Ben Folks. Yeah, it's a, he's, he's a really interesting player and he's got a lot of hype. Uh, and actually, until last season, he didn't regularly play. He didn't command a spot in the Surrey team necessarily. Um, and he played a couple of eye-catching knots last summer, um, but he still only averaged around about 40, which is a good summer, don't get me wrong. But um, uh, a colleague, Ben, was at the Essex Media Day and Jordan Cox, who's uh, a confident young guy was talking about wanting to do a Harry Brook um, where basically Harry Brook, if you rewind two summers ago, went into the 2022 English summer averaging 27 in first class cricket and then averaged 100. And then by the time the English, English test summer started, everyone wanted him in the side. 
and I and I wonder. I think there are a few players who are young, who are talked about, who are probably capable of going on a run like that, where you where you're so good, you 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 sort of have to disrupt whatever England are planning. Um, and yeah, Smith, yeah, Smith's one, Jordan Cox is is, is potentially another. Jack Haynes at Worcester, possibly an, um, an another. Um, Phil, who who are you going for? Breakout star. Well, I like Jack Haynes. Uh, you mentioned him a couple of times now. Uh, I interviewed him actually a few weeks ago. Um, he's a likable kid. He had a strange year last year with Worcester because he'd signed that contract for knots halfway through the year. So, you know, he, he speaks very respectfully, actually, of, of the Worcester fan base and the, the club as well, who obviously gave him his chance. But it felt like a kind of a, a holding pattern year, really, for him last year. So that'd be interesting to see how he goes. Uh, another sort of middle order stroke maker type is James Coles at Sussex, uh, who we put in our 11 to watch in WCM this month. Uh, Buckinghamshire born, immaculately educated, Marlborough, Marlborough College dweller. If I said he's the Dexter Mayhew of county cricket, would you know what that means? Yeah, yeah I do. Lovely. Uh, you know, that, that suggests, uh, Probably giving up the game by by thirty. Very possibly, um, <laughs> officer class demeanour, uh, all of that, and of course England are, are impressed with his yeah. his style, and they've already fast tracked him into the Lions squad. He's a he's a punchy kind of Bearstow like batter. Um, it's very strong through the offside, punches off the back foot really really well. Um, bowls a bit of off spin as well. Well, no left, left arm, arm spin. spin sorry, yeah. left arm spin. Yeah, so. So he, he'd be an interesting one to watch, I think. Mm. Um, I mentioned earlier Feroz Kushi at Essex, who's a stroke maker. He's a lovely player to watch. Um, he's very East London, you know. <laughs> he's, he's wrists to die for. Mm. Uh, will it work at the top of the order? Will he even get the nod at the top of uh, top of the order? Perhaps not. But I think in the absence of Lawrence, he'll play a fair amount of red ball cricket. And he's, he's a useful white ball cricketer. It, he might totally blow out, but... They like him there. They've been keeping him under wraps for the last two or three years and they need a better option at, at the top of the order. They can't mm. just go in there with an Elgar and a Nick Brown. They need a bit more fizz mm. up the top. So it might be that he, he gets a go. Kushi sounds like the sort of guy who, if he goes well, we're going to hear about a lot on this podcast. Why would you possibly think that? I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Uh, History suggests. On the, on the other side of the the line, Finley Bean, um, mm. who didn't make great runs last year for for Yorkshire, but but played well in parts. Also made a quadruple hundred in second team cricket the year before. Mm. Uh, and people don't pay that much attention to him because he was playing in Division 2. And he's a left-handed opener who doesn't necessarily get you there for half 10 in the morning, ready to roll. But he's a really good technician. And I watched a bit of him last year uh, and they really like him up there. He was just shy of a thousand runs, so he had a good year. Mm. But, you know, in Div 2, you might not notice him too much, but he's the kind of player I think who could have a really, really big, heavy year. Uh, and just quickly, as a bowler, we tipped him last year and he barely played because he was injured in part. But Mitchell Stanley, who's now gone to Lancashire, mm. who's a quick bowler, quick, quick bowler, went from Worcester to Lanx. Uh, and they were talking him up as a red ball as well as white ball threat. Um, might be that he doesn't play that much Red Bull stuff, but if he does, it'll be worth watching because, mm. of course, pace does its thing and speaks for itself. Mm. One, one other person that I just think is worthy of mention, and I don't think I don't want to tip him as a breakout star, but it's Josh Hull at Leicestershire. Mm. Yeah. And there, there's, there's buzz yeah. about him. I love cricket because cricket is one of those sports where you're just like, oh, he's tall, he's left-handed. <laughs> yeah, he could be really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But he does have those two attributes and they are so important in cricket. And you go, oh, we you know, can have our own Mitchell Stark here. Um, he's incredibly young. He's incredibly raw. He, he's, he's probably far too inexperienced to be a breakout star in 2024. You never know, though. You never know. Yeah. With the quicks, it happens at a different pace to everyone else. And, and he, he, he did um, some interviews this week and he suggested that he has hopefully put on a few extra yards um, over the winter and wants to be now bowling high 80s. That's the speed that we know that Rocky then starts getting interested. So it will be booking flight soon. So yeah, um, it will be very interesting to see how Hull gets on at Leicester. Mm. How much of an opportunity he gets, um, whether his body can hold up as well, mm. uh, which is always a huge factor at a young age when you are very tall. Mm. Um, we're, we're talking a little bit more about Div Two players. Um, ben, who, who are you tipping for promotion? 
so oh, this is the third time I've mentioned odds now um, during the recording of this <laughs> podcast, but. Uh, I mentioned that Surrey were were something like seven to four. Yorkshire are also something like seven to four mm. to win um, win Division Two. They do just look a class above. And if you look at their batting lineup early season, that really, as long as the rain doesn't um, wash out too many games, that should just be enough to win the title by what end of May. <laughs> <laughs> they're just they're just too strong. Their bowling attack is brilliant. Obviously, they've been subject to lots of injuries in recent years but you combine that the strength of the batting lineup with the bowling lineup if most of them can stand up throughout the season and they're winning really it's just very hard to see any any other division two side being half as strong as yorkshire yeah i mean i, I think for yorkshire it, it does hinge on the fitness of the seamers i think they found that when the main guys aren't fit there's been quite a big drop off and they've struggled to get themselves over. Like, i mean to be honest actually not hugely dissimilar to, to how Sussex have been recently, where uh, my, my hottest take of 2023 was uh, Steve Smith cost Sussex a shot of promotion because it, when he came in, Nathan McAndrew came out the side and they actually struggled to win games. Um, and yeah, I, I, on, on Yorkshire's batting lineup is, is ridiculously stacked uh, for, for any division, let alone Div, Div 2. Um, Phil, how, how do you see it in, in Div 2? North Ants as well as Yorkshire, I think. Hmm. I think they've, they fought hard last year, especially at the back end. They've got Karen there, who's going to be, he's going to break records. <laughs> he's going to break records. He was irresistible uh, in the two or three games he played at the end of the year. He made 150 at the Oval. He made a really good 70 on his debut. Uh, he's just a class, he's class, class, international class player who's going to be playing Div 2 cricket, batting at four, uh, and he's going to go at his own pace, play his own game. Stand at second slip, hardly say a word all year, and break records. Um, mm. And I think he will bat them to to promotion. Uh, they've, they've also got some very useful seamers as yeah. well. You know, so I think I think they will they will take twenty wickets in on result pitches in Division Two. Uh, Jack White's a really good seamer, um, uh, who was their standout last year. Ben Sarnison's still yeah. running on, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Jack White is is genuinely, I think, one of the best uncapped players in the. But seamers in the country. He was excellent um, from and, what I saw and, last and, year. And for him, I think for, for the Northlands to retain him is, is, is quite a big deal, I think. Um, elsewhere, I think Glamorgan have recruited quite well. They've got Lavashane again and have brought in Mason Crane for the whole season. Fascinating to see how Crane goes. Crane's barely played Red Bull cricket over the last couple of years. Um, and they've also got Mir Hamza, who's played a bit of county cricket before. Um, but he looked really good on Pakistan's tour of Australia over the winter. Um Elsewhere, I guess it's Sussex. I think we're in with a pretty good shout, as you said earlier, Ben. Yeah. If Robinson's yeah. around for a lot of the early season, um, he's someone who's got an outstanding. His, his domestic record of the last few years is ridiculous. He's just not played that much for Sussex when Sussex have really struggled. Yeah, yeah. His domestic record is is outrageous. So if he plays a lot, you've then got um, the the overseas. They'll be rotating the other um, seamer overseas mm. between McAndrew and. Um, I've forgotten his name, Jaden. Uh, uh, Jaden Seals. Jaden yeah, Seals, yeah. that's it. Um, you've got Pajara, mm. so he's scoring the runs. Um, it, it does feel like this is quite an important season for Sussex, really, mm. because they've been in turmoil for a couple of years now, or more than a couple of years. And really, it's been um, investing in the future, and it's all about the future. There has to come a point where the future comes good, and they've gone about this... Um, this structure of bringing in these very senior players, John Simpson's come in, he's going to mm. captain them, which, which seems like a great signing and he's going to mentor them and he's going to bring them through. But there does come a point where they have to come through. Mm. Um, and you, you mentioned Coles earlier. He's one of those players where this almost, this is a season where he, he does have to come through. Mm. Um, if they come through, they've got Robinson and Simpson and Pajara. They've got these incredibly talented mm. senior players. And if just a couple of those younger guys come through this year, yeah, they should get promoted. The, definitely. The, the pro you don't disagree with any of that, but the, the pitches are a problem there. Taking 20 wickets is hard at, at Hove, you know. And They're not the only county to have that in Div 2. No, um, no, sure. Derbyshire have got a sure. problem winning games. Um, I think... Yeah, Gloucester, I don't think won a, won a game last year. There were Last year, there were very few results in Div 2. Mm. Uh, like Durham aside, everyone was mm. really struggling. Um, but then Durham showed the model. You know, you've got to mm. go out there and play your shots. 
you've got to find enough time in the game to force a result, even if it means that you end up falling down at the end. Mm. That's the way to get out of it. Yeah, I mean, as, as I mentioned, Gloucester and Derbyshire win this last year. Uh, Gloucester, the, the Price brothers are highly rated. Cameron Bancroft is, is a solid overseas signing. Um, I think they'll do much better this year, but it's, it's a big jump for them to be in the promotion race after what happened last year. At Derbyshire, something to look out for. Sam and Patel is supposed to be playing Red Bull cricket again. Yeah, I heard so that. that. So that'd be, that'd lovely. be lovely. Um, mi- Middlesex, we've not talked about much, but, um, you know, I, I, I think they'll go pretty well. Um, Deploy is a, is a brilliant sign. He's one of the best Div 2 batters going. And that attack, I still think, will do really well in, in Div 2. So I think I think they'll be right in the mix. And Leicester came quite close last year, lost a couple of players over the winter as well. So I think they, they might they might struggle. Um, I'll be pleasantly surprised if they're in the hunt as much this season as they were last season. Um, anyway, moving on, as we mentioned at the start, Ben's got a new book out, Batting for Time, The Fight to Keep English Cricket Alive. Um, listeners may well have seen some quotes from the book appear in the national papers over the last week or so. It's talk of the town. Talk it's of the, the town, talk of the town. Um, the quote that probably did the rounds the most was from Tim Bostock, the Durham CEO. Um, for context, Durham are one of the three counties that are not owned by the members. And Bostock has this quote that says, um, of all the millions of people who watch cricket in the English summer, the whole structure is being dictated to by what might only be about 10,000 people. You've got chairman threatened with removal if they don't do what a small ham- handful of Luddites say, and they are Luddites. They are passionate Luddites, but they are Luddites. I just don't know how they think it will survive without radical change. Um, obviously, um, some members weren't particularly happy with with the phrasing of that from Bostock. But my first question is, Ben, why, as Bostock says, is county cricket in danger of not surviving without radical change? So... Um, Bostock is a very interesting character because a lot of chairmen and CEOs in county cricket are cricket born and bred, um, invariably from the county that they now work at. Um, now Bostock isn't isn't that. Uh, I think he played cricket to a very high level, but his background, his professional background, is in banking, um, and he he suggests that he, um, that's an advantage because he can be more objective. Um, He's not too close to it and therefore mm. he can criticize. I think um, he has uh, acknowledged that he used inflammatory language and he shouldn't have used it. But he argues that the, the sport in England is it's too close minded and it needs to broaden. And he, he gave an example in banking whereby um, it's like county cricket currently is where banking was 10 years ago where or maybe slightly longer where where everyone was still going in into branches um and but internet banking had arrived or was just about to arrive and really the whole landscape of banking needed to change and it had to change rapidly otherwise it would be screwed basically Mm. um and with the spread of franchise cricket and with various other things that are going on in in cricket globally County cricket is seeing what is going on. And he's basically saying that you've got to change now. You've got to go with it. Otherwise you're going to be left for dead. Mm. Um, and he's saying that in his professional experience in banking, he's seen what you have to do, the, the rate of change that has to happen. Um, there are plenty of people that do not agree with him. There are plenty of people that don't want, might agree with him, but don't want to or won't admit it. Mm. Um, but I think he certainly has a hell of a point. There, there are ways to look at county cricket. Um, and obviously, county cricket has struggled financially, not just in the recent past. That's been a historical problem um, for, for many clubs. There are some things you could look at in the county game that, that look like they're in decent health. The streams, for example, um, that's something that, that has made it much more accessible. Is is, fran- is it franchise cricket that's the threat to, to, to county cricket or, or is it broader problems? I think franchise cricket is the threat, uh, but it... It materializes in a few, it sort of comes through in a few different routes. One is, um, the main one is that there are just these incredibly lucrative franchise Mm. leagues. Um, So the players are just going to go and play where they can earn more money, which is completely fair enough. It's the same in any industry. If you can earn loads of money, you're going to go and do it. Um, But there are various other smaller impacts 
that that might that fra- that the increase in franchise leagues has one of those is on potentially on player production so if the franchises start to produce their own players mm. then this whole county model the academy model that has been in place for a very long time and that has been the way that english players are produced that then suddenly has a huge challenge to it um the the privatization issue it seems like obviously the hundred is going to have private investment put into it that is in effect to challenge the franchises uh, the franchise leagues worldwide the problem is that there are only a certain number of hundred teams therefore the counties that are attached to those hundred teams get that private investment they then get more wealthy the ones that don't get an investment suffer further so then you have this two-tier system of the already wealthy becoming even wealthier and the already poor becoming even poorer now that's not a direct impact of franchise leagues but it is an indirect impact because it's the ecb trying to strengthen the hundred to combat the other franchise leagues Mm. and in turn it could mean that round about half the uh, English counties really suffer financially. Mm. It feels like county cricket exists in, in, a, in a very weird place at the moment in that it produces all the players that play test cricket for England, play in the 100, which is where majority of the broadcast revenue comes from. But objectively, it is not that popular and a lot of the counties struggle financially. You know, we talk about memberships in a bit, but memberships are relatively low among many many of the counties um we talk about this on the show before and i know i just said that streaming is 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 a good development i think streaming numbers are not as high as counties make them out to be if you compare it to provincial cricket in ireland that often has comparable live streaming numbers to, to what county cricket has um but then onto the membership which is in which is related to the privatization question out of all the cricket fans in the uk who spend money on watching cricket and are involved in cricket, uh, you know, if, if you're someone who is a Sky Cricket subscriber, uh, or not even a Sky Cricket su- subscriber, uh, someone who goes to two days of Test Match Cricket a summer, you pay a lot of money, but don't have as much influence as a small number of county members who own 15 of the 18 counties, and for anything to change, you need two thirds of the counties to vote for it. So it feels odd that there's that much power among such a small number of people do you think that's fair yeah definitely and the number really is minuscule so the figure that i used in my book which was quite hard to ascertain because counties are not particularly forthcoming about um giving these figures is that there were sixty nine thousand full adult county members in 2022 um th- that's across the 18 counties um Three of those counties, like you said before, are not member owned, so they don't effectively don't have a say. Um, But even if you take that 69,000, how many of them are ardent enough to vote in the AGMs and go to the county forums? A very small number, let's say Mm. 10,000. I I think it's Tim Tim Bostock in the book says 10,000. That is a tiny, tiny number of people. to be to have such a large say in the future of English cricket and they do tend to be of a certain demographic of a certain age of a certain sex um of a certain background um, old, old white men I'm not going to say it but you can say it <laughs> yeah but that's that's the established mm. demographic and it's obviously not the entire demographic but that's mm. the the overwhelming demographic uh, identity of of county members which is not criticism but that's just that's just a fact. Hmm. It's, it's, it, I think, nine, 90% white, 90% male. Yeah. Uh, and many of them are on the older side of the ledger. Hmm. Uh, they should retain a voice, I think, in, in any county club. Absolutely, they should. Uh, I think the North Hants model is quite an interesting one in that they became a limited company, I think, in 2016, 17. Uh, but they retain a kind of uh, a fan's voice in the boardroom and they've, they've given, they gave certainly at the time an option to buy shares within the club as part of the, of the publicly listed company. Uh, they, I know somebody on the board there and, and, and he spoke to me a couple of years ago and he was full of the joys of, of spring because they were making money and, and they were moving towards being financially independent of the ECB, which is their ultimate game, game, um, ultimate plan. If you like, they're not there yet. 
but they're on the way. Uh, and Northampton are a relatively prosperous club because they took that, that route. Other clubs have done it. Most clubs remain members only, correct? Yep. Uh, there's a fundamental tension there, massively so. And if you disenfranchise the people who still show up on a, on a Friday morning, the people who still uh, are so essential to the, the fundamental identity of the thing, what is, what's the purpose of a county club? Well, it's, it's multifaceted, overwhelmingly, to produce top quality cricketers to play for England and also to put on a show to bring in new fans and to keep the whole enterprise on the road. But it's also to provide a service to, to, to your members. And you might not necessarily be paying members, but you are still a part of the fabric of it. Not everybody who goes along is a paid up member. You might just be free that week. These are still absolutely essential figures within the, the identity of any, of any county club. Uh, nonetheless, the world has shifted so far and the sporting landscape has shifted so far away from, I think, how you described it, like the sort of Victorian model mm. where county clubs have been members-only clubs since the 1870s and 1880s. How that fits in to a rapidly changing global landscape, right, where you have this product, this English product, that is a multi-million pound and popular thing. If you take it in the round, English cricket is immensely popular and has many, many reasons to be pretty chipper about itself. And make no mistake, there are people queuing up to want to invest in this thing. Uh, it has consequences for its globalist reluctant reluctant approach towards a kind of globalist expansionist outlook but it's unavoidable it's unavoidable if we want to retain the 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 scale and the breadth of the thing i'm, a, I'm i hate to say it but there are 18 professional c clubs and I, I we want that in perpetuity as uh one of the ceos perhaps the worcester ceo i forget but they said we want this club to still be here in a hundred years. How the hell do we get? How do, how the hell does it, does this club still mm. stand in a hundred years? If I've misquoted somebody, I've, but that's that's what's at, at stake here. Counties have been perpetually in crisis for a long, long time. There was a really interesting story in the cricket or two, recently, uh, which I think was referenced actually in in the the article on the Telegraph, where, which took a lot from Ben's book. Uh, I think five counties have been not exactly bailed out, but have gone to the ECB for emergency funding in the last two years. Now, obviously, that's kind of COVID in the shadow of, for mm. sure. But this is not new. Mm. Kent went to Canterbury County Council, uh, Kent County Council, about six or seven years ago and managed to get a last-minute bailout. Yorkshire have debts as long as your arm. This is the reality. And, and, mm. that, and one club there is a you know, a non-test match net mm. venue and the other one is, a, is an institution. That is the reality. That is what's at stake. And so to be, to fear that your identity is ripped asunder by the advent of private investment and uh, turning yourself outward, I just, I, I think you ultimately, you end up, it's a self-defeating position ultimately i fear mm. and while i understand that people feel like so much their lifeblood is being ripped apart and there's so much their identity is wrapped up in a, in a county club and it's a beautiful thing and we've spoken to people and seen people and i feel an element of that myself i grew up watching essex essex at chelmsford and i loved it and it was an essential part of my my early years and it re and i retain a lot of love for it uh but it's because i love it that we have to be having these conversations and mm. you have to have written this book and this book has to be read pragmatically as well as emotionally. Mm. Uh, I agree with, well, I'll leave a bit about the book aside, but I, I agree with all of your sentiments. <laughs> to, um, to tell me which bits I'm, I'm being the, naive about because no, you, no, you've no. spoken to a hundred people, literally a hundred people in this book. You're, you're not being naive and I, and I, I do agree with you. Um, and there does have to be an element of pragmatism around how traditionalists view the future of the county game 
what I suspect some people, um, and Richard Gould actually is one of them, and I quote him in the book saying this, is that privatization is not the golden egg. Mm. That it, it, it doesn't mean that they're going to be standing in 100 years. You look at rugby, and rugby uh, have had a number of clubs in the past 18 months, um, privately owned clubs, fall fall away. Um, football invariably has teams they're they're all privately owned and they fall away as well and the fear that so many county members voice to me um, is that they worry about who are these owners going to be because they've seen similar clubs or comparable clubs in other sports um, go down that route and it all falls apart and then their club is no more now this is where the the relationship between your county clubs and your hundred franchises is so fascinating and quite jagged, but there has to be a connection between the two if county clubs hope to survive. The hundred is not going to go away, and there's many good reasons why the hundred shouldn't go away. And if significant p- private investment doesn't necessarily come through the doors of, say, a Wantage Road uh, or a Taunton, but it does come through the doors of what could become a kind of globally recognized franchise over the next three, four, ten years, something that is watched by millions of people in mm. India, something that is followed in Pakistan, something is, that is followed across the, the globe, even filters into America at some point down the line, and that that is your, your presentation to the world. And that money, if it's used responsibly, can then be used to replenish and keep certain counties alive. Mm. And much of it comes down to the vision of the ECB and how much you, you back them and how much you trust them, right? But if we get to that point, and you said earlier, it's inevitable, right? That, that money, money will be coming in from outside. It's inevitable that it will be coming into the 100 from outside. If we believe in the ECB's current management team, and if we truly believe that the 18-county model needs to be, wants to be protected by those who make these decisions because they are not just important entities and institutions on their own terms, but because they are providing, they are cradles of cricket across the country, which are there to bring through quality, there to replenish the top levels of the game. If we believe that that's the case, then it seems to me that the most obvious and perhaps even the only way to bring in significant money to future proof it is through this, the franchise mm. model, is through the 100. And although, and that might be a hard pill to swallow, and I get it, and I wish we weren't having these conversations on a certain level. I mean, you know, I'm an, I'm an old-fashioned lefty. I'm, I don't <laughs> want to be having these conversations, but I'm trying to figure out how to, yeah. how to h- hold the workforce together, I, I, how to hold... 450 professional cricketers whose, whose, whose backs are going to be turned by the prospect of other options, lucrative, dirty, op, dirty money options in this, in this, that and the other across the world. How do we hold on to it? This is one of my main thoughts, actually, reading, reading the book, was I think, and maybe I'm being naive here, I think that uh, we potentially over the threat of franchise cricket to county cricket in particular. Um Franchi- I wanted to come to this because Fran- I, I Fran- tend to agree with franchise you. Franchise cricket has, has, has now, in its current form, been around for, for a while now. I know there are new leagues that have come in. We don't know how sustainable these are. A lot of people who are really in the know, who play in these leagues, uh, w- would cast doubt over how viable it is to how, have this many leagues. Um, I think there's a section in the book where you talk to a couple of agents and one of them talks about Craig Overton wanting to up his white ball skills, so maximise his earning potential in the later stage of his career. Craig Overton is one of the best English bowlers, right? And he struggles to get these gigs. So I don't think we're that close to a scenario where a lot of players are going to be choosing not to play in England when the English season is going on. Um, Alex Hales is the only one really I could think of who's gone that way. Jason Roy, uh, sort of, um, he, he for went a, a central contract to take a, a deal in the MLC, but he's not missing loads of cricket for it. Alex Hales is the only one I can really think of who's missing a lot of domestic cricket to play in something else. I don't think we're that close to franchise cricket, robbing loads of players. Could, could away I, can from I also add, cricket. um, 
even if you lose a decent chunk, there's loads more coming through. Mm. There's always talents around the corner. There's always watchable, aspiring cricketers. Yeah. And part of the reason why they're aspiring is because the the, the road to riches and stardom is paved out there for you. You can mm. see it now and you can see it. And it's more persuasive now than ever before. I mean, you're just looking at the women's game in particular. Uh, and so I'm not as fearful as perhaps other people are about this sort of talent drain away from the, the county game. But what I will add is that if your top level price remains at say 120 grand, 125 grand mm. for your top level players in the hundred. Uh, and we know that even the best paid county cricketers are on considerably less than that, or not considerably, but in some cases that most cases they're on mm. much less than that. We need to therefore find more money to be ploughed into the game. And however much that might feel ugly and a bit cynical and talking about money and sport is an innately ugly conversation. You see how this figured football at the top level is because of, of, of the sort of the, the ubiquity of money and the predominance of money. Nonetheless, I think what's at stake is the, is, is the future of this game. I really do. And, and this, is what, this is what we are fighting for. This is what we are debating here. Mm. Uh, and players have so much power now. They have so much power and they have so many options. And it's not just the top 1%, it's perhaps the top six or seven. Mm. And while I'm comfortable that there's 93% of those who might not get those gigs who are still really watchable and can still add much to, it, to the fabric of the game, if we want to keep the balance tilted towards the English game, and I think we should be confident that we can do that, and I don't think we need to fear this. I don't think we need to fear the inevitability of private investment. Mm. Uh, that said, I do completely agree with what Ben said about it not being the, the silver bullet. You know, like a lot of people. Um, uh, so, so for example, Manoj Badale was on the Sky Cricket podcast a couple of weeks ago. And he was talking about private investment as this almost utopian thing. This is good for everyone. And he said, oh, you know, for example, you improve fan in, stadium infrastructure, you improve the stadium experience. And then 10 minutes later, he was talking about how bad the Rajasthan Stadium is 17 years after he first put money in. You know, it's not an absolute guarantee. And also these people are in it for, for, for their own interest, right? They're not you know they're not doing this for the goodness of the game they're doing it you know the of course improvements of course improvements uh, uh, happen to happen rather than the the, the reason they go into of course it. but um, look if there was a way that you could create growth centrally right it's, it's we're at this conversation <laughs> now if the ecb could adopt adopt a kind of keynesian economic philosophy then sure but i don't see how we can do that with what mm. we have with what we're working with um, Will Brown, the CEO at Gloucester, who's a brilliant geezer, right? And and I know, you, and he features in this piece on the t in Telegraph, and you spoke to him for your book, right? And he's he's progressive, uh, he's approachable, he has a really clear reading, I think, of the challenges of the, the county game faces. Crucially, he's leading a very lovable and progressive-minded cricket club, but one who doesn't have a pot to piss in. Mm. And he wants to he wants to move away from Bristol. He wants to move away from Neville Road to somewhere uh, where it can begin to compete at the top level. But in the meantime, he's running his P and Ls and wondering how they're going to pay salaries that month, that 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 summer. And he's quite open in what he said to you. I mean, do, do, go yourself, Ben. But I mean, the piece is in is in the Telegraph, right? He says. Well, I can quote it back, you know, within the next five years, I can see private equity ownership of maybe half the counties. Maybe that's how 18 counties survive. Sure, it becomes a much more commercial beast, which is scary, which is his quote. Uh, but I think that is what's at stake. I really mm. do. I th a phrase that I have found myself using a lot is pragmatic traditionalist. And I think he is a pragmatic traditionalist. I think in his core, he would like the structure to stay exactly as it is because that's what he he grew up watching it and he talked to me about sitting revising for his GCSEs with a I think he said with a with a can of beer which actually probably would lead <laughs> not to very good revision um but he talked about growing up watching the county game um and he would love it to remain as it is but it's not the reality certainly for a club like Gloucestershire mm. and so um th there was 
maybe maybe I was reading too much into it, but I almost felt like he was being a little bit apologetic when he talks about having to move to a new ground and right. having mm. to seek private investment. And it's not what he wants, but he knows it's what the club needs and he knows it's what the game needs. Now, there are members, there are members that would rather the club wither and they would say not die because they would say, well, we'll always be a, even if we get downgraded to a national slash minor county, they would rather retain the sense of community that this club has had for a hundred plus years, even if they are a minor slash national um, mm. county. That's they would they would rather go down that route than go down mm. the private route. Um, what that is not good for is the future of English cricket mm. as a whole. Mm. And so it's very much trying to remove um, these people that want their community based structure to remain as it always has. And that's what that's their mind. But the ECB and people like Will Brown have to think about the, the good of the game. Mm. Um, and, and then you also have just up the road from Gloucester, bad geography, but not that far. You have Rod Bransgrove at Hampshire who is unapologetic about mm. the... That's really not great geography. It's terrible so, geography. <laughs> I, I, I live in London. I, I'm, a, I'm a shocking human being. We all know that. Uh, uh, but Rod, Rod Bransgrove. Yeah. At Hampshire. Uh, who's quoted in one of the many pieces, one of the many Ben Blooms that have been kicking around this week. <laughs> and I think he was kind of unapologetic about uh, the the two tiereness of of count the county system. He says, "Look, it's, it's sport. It's it's mm. a it's the ultimate meritocracy. If 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 you run yourself well, and if you if you're canny with your recruitment of new fans, and if you run the, your business smartly, uh, brackets if you become a, a limited company <laughs> and and I own the thing, then I can do what what I like with it. And what he's done, obviously, is 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 impressive. Mm. Um, Hampshire used to be a you know." A lovable smallish club playing out of what was it Northland Road, and and now they're a you know they host test matches mm. uh, and make good money uh, and are one of the top three performing teams county teams year after year. Uh, he would have no, li little truck with our kind of sort of hand wringing here because he would say, well, you know, that's life, folks. Mm. That's life. This is sport. Get on with it. It's a meritocracy. Mm. And he and he prefers Red Bull cricket. He prefers long form cricket. He said that to me, but I mean, everyone does because long form is the best. <laughs> but um, but he but he thinks about it like a like a businessman. But that that does almost paint him out to be too hard nosed. Um, actually, he is a businessman. Mm. He is a very successful businessman. But he he does want the sport to grow. There's a brilliant quote in the book um, where he told me that he received an email from a member, um, a Hampshire member, who went to. Uh, he didn't want to go, but he did go to check it out—a game of a, ga a hundred game at the the Rose Bowl, um, Utilita Bowl, I believe it's now called. Um, Rod Gra Bransgrove will be very pleased that I got the business <laughs> name in there. Um, so this member went down to the game, and he emailed Rod Bransgrove afterwards, and he said it was it was my worst nightmare. It was everything I feared. I couldn't hear myself think for the noise of children screaming. Um, they weren't watching their game. They were trying to get autographs. They were, they were, you know, not sitting down and fully taking in every every ball that's bowled and every shot that's played. And, and Brands Gross was thrilled with this. Yeah, and he said, of course he was. That's well, that's exactly what the hundred is there for. Mm. Um, and and so Rod Brownsgrove, even if that's not his favourite form of the game, he's going, well, look what it's doing. Mm. But then in that email, you see that's that's the problem inherent in it because mm. these people that have loved the game and have plowed so much money and time and love and investment and energy into the game for decades mm. are really being turned off by it um it's very much sort of small mind thinking versus big mind thinking but you can understand the small minds so, so you're as qualified as anyone having written this book now uh, to answer this question where where do you, how do you think county cricket will be different in five ten years time um i don't know where the big change will be coming five years, maybe too soon, but in 10 to 15 or however many years, mm. I think there is definitely going to be a two tiered structure, whether it's, what, what, sorry, what, that, yeah, what, what does, does that mean? mean? Okay. So whether it's formal or not formal, um, remains to be seen 
as to how successful the ECB will be. Because the ECB would like to have a, a Premier League, Red Bull Premier League. Um, and then you can have the white ball competitions as a sort of, well, anyone can try their luck. But they have a Red Bull Premier League because they just want to have the best playing the best. And I think what I mean by a two-tiered system is the wealthy are getting wealthier and the poor are getting poorer. And the wealthy are getting access. So they have international cricket at their grounds. So they make money from that. They have the hundred, so they make money from that. Private investment is coming into the hundred and the host counties are going to be able to do what they want with their share of the team. So they can sell it, they can make more money if they so want. We've got this um, this ongoing um, women with, with women's cricket, this situation where they're bidding, this bid process. Mm. The chances are that those eight teams are going to go to the big eight counties as well. So you're going to have a huge disparity between what they actually are now. You know, it's not about the future. It's what those counties are now. It's, yeah. it, it's informally two tiers. Yes, they, they are now. But but all of those things are, are going to bring in more and more money. It is it is coming down to money. So Surrey, Lancashire, Warwickshire, Yorkshire, all of those compared to Derbyshire, Leicestershire, Glamorgan, Gloucestershire, they can, they. There has been an informal two-tier structure, but the finances are just going to get so great, the disparity between them, that they are not going to be able to compete. Mm. And the the quality of players is going to be... I, I would envisage the quality gap between the two tiers is going to be enormous. Um, that's what the ECB want, really, because they want a smaller cohort of top-quality players. They want to reduce the gap from domestic to international that then, by its very nature, means that you have some pretty rubbish counties. Um, there is an argument, well, if you're not producing England players, what you, what's, what's your purpose? That, that's mm. a sort of whole different um, debate. But I think you will have some incredibly strong counties, basically like Surrey now, but you'll have six, six Surreys, um, and you'll have half a dozen, if not more, pretty rubbish, borderline national counties. Mm amongst the 18 that currently exist. That's not the cheeriest end to that chat, but I've I've genuinely really enjoyed reading Ben's book. It, it's a very thorough account of where the game is right now. And I think whatever your view, um, it is worth reading because all sides are aired. Um, ben, where, where should people go to get the book? Oh, um, you can you can go wherever you want. There is, there is Amazon, mm. um, but it'd be nice to go down to your local local bookshop as well nice um some big news from yesterday our very own katia whitney won the cmj young domestic journalist of the year uh hugely deserved um second wisdom winner in as many years after taha hashim formerly of this parish won it last year we're just a um, talent factory and, and ben gardner was the only person highly commended as well so um a a, a clean sweep in a way yeah uh, well done them yeah um, it's, it's just hugely deserved news. Great news. Um, and Cathy's had a great chat with Keith Barker, who we were originally going to put in this episode, but actually we're going to put in next week's episode. So uh, watch out for that. Um, next up is a chat that I had with David Bates from Total Play on what they have in store for your cricket club. David, talk to me about the history of Total Play. What do Total Play do? Well, um, basically, we're cricket specialists. Um, I hope in that we've sort of created the sort of go-to suppliers for design and installation of both natural and synthetic cricket pitches, really. Um, my history coming from up north in Keithley and, and in Yorkshire, I was lucky enough to play all the county school boys. Uh, cricket from 11 all the way up to Yorkshire second team gave me an insight into, obviously, the professional game. Um, there was a certain Michael Vaughan that came along just slightly younger than me and, and as a another opening batsman, he was just, just a fraction better than I was. So I'm afraid I didn't cut the grade and so I, I, didn't, I didn't make it into the, obviously, the first team. I played second team, but I didn't make it into the first team and then played for Harrogate. Um, and, but then in, once I stopped playing, then I, I was groundsman at, at Harrogate Cricket Club where we used to have an outground. And then um, when I was 21, I was asked to be head groundsman down at North Ants, where I was chairman of the First House Groundsman's Committee and um, was then the IOG, the Institute of Groundsmanship, training courses, etc. And I did that for seven or eight years. We had the World Cup and, you know, hosted a lot of games. 
And then 20 years ago, um, I resigned from that position and set up Total Tour Solutions, which is a consultancy company, which I'm still doing works for Sport England, ECB, um, Football Foundation. I've done a load of work previously for the RFU. So and I've designed and built just about every type of sports pitch you can think of. But over the last sort of 15 years, really, we've built up Total Play as a cricket-specific company. Well, I'll get back on the tools and build some natural pitches. Um, or um, for 12 months of the year, we have teams, three or four teams going around, in-house teams that are employed by the company, and we'll go around and refurb and design and build lots of different types of synthetic systems from match pitches to 10-lane systems and to the new hybrid system with other cricket shield like we've got at Bradford now. So um, hopefully with my background and then the people and the specialists that I've brought in and the sales team and some fantastic installers that we have that have been getting very wet all winter. Um, we've got a good in-house team that we have control over. Um, and basically this is what we do day in, day out. So it's something that we've been able to be fine, uh, be, so to be fine over the years and, and make sure we're having best practice across the board. Um, is there an increase in demand over the years for synthetic pitches? And, and if so, why, why is that the case? Um, I think over the years, um, there's been, well, since the sort of non-turf pitches or astral pitches or artificial pitches came into being um, since the sort of late 70s, early 80s, um, I don't necessarily think they've been fantastic. And so people haven't really wanted to play in them that much. Um, but over the last 15 or 18 years, uh, with participation rates of cricket increasing, the expectation of cricket is wanting to play on better surfaces and the bat sort of really taking over the ball. I mean, the mentality of cricket since I started playing from, you know, from Jeff Boycott, you know, playing down the line and trying to leave everything to now, if you don't hit it for four, then you're doing something wrong, um, has changed. Um, and then obviously with the uh, with women and girls cricket coming on on board, there's a hell of a lot more people playing, and the cost of maintaining uh, natural squares in parklands and for councils is you know it's just astronomical. They can't afford to do that. It's meant that a lower a lot of lower level cricket is far better played on synthetic pitches. And then when you become a better player, then it's obviously, it's, there's nothing like playing on a well-prepared natural pitch. That's what we should be playing on. But there's definitely a crossover between playing on a good quality synthetic and then moving yourself onto a good quality natural pitch. So yeah, from a synthetic point of view, it's moved on from gameplay. But realistically now, if, if you want to be a recognised local grassroots cricket club, You've got to have a you've got to have a, a two lane system or a three lane system, some form of practice facility that can be used all year round. It attracts players, it gets local kids there playing, and therefore the boom really has been being on off field practice facilities. Uh, and because we're building them fully enclosed now, they they're used every single day, um, you know, throughout the winter. And therefore, this is where we've really seen the boom in in is off field practice facilities really. Mm. Um, talk to me about the Cricket Shield. This looks very exciting. Well, the Cricket Shield is great. I've been working um, very closely with ECB for about three or four years in, in basically trying to fill this gap in between an indoor facility that obviously costs millions and millions of pounds because they're typically heated, completely covered, and they have different sort of planning regulations and restrictions too. Uh, set against open non-turf practice facilities, which are uh, created for outdoor use. So what we tr what we have done and what we've been trying to do is basically increase usage of an outdoor facility. So therefore, we are maximising use in the summer. So people still want to play in there in the summer, which is really opposite from indoor. Because an indoor facility is fantastic in the winter, don't get me wrong. They're needed because they're warm and obviously they're covered and they're not affected by the weather at all. But what you find is that people don't really want to go in there in the summer. Um, so it's heavily used in the winter, and then obviously it, the, you know, the, the capacity levels and things just drop down in the in the in the summer. So what we try to do is increase participation in the winter by covering and lighting an outdoor facility, uh, and I think that's really what we've achieved. Um, the 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 cricket shield or the cricket domes, which are hybrid systems, they're not heated. They have open sides, which cools it down in the summer, and you get a little bit of wind, so it makes you feel you know, like playing outside. 
Uh, they've got translucent membranes, so you get natural light. You don't have to have light on all the time. But also we've designed state-of-the-art lighting system, which is just moves all the, you know, cricket specific lighting systems forward with the standards and the way that we've done that. There's been a lot of research gone into the lighting system because it's on sensors and we have minimum lux levels and maximum lux levels. And it, it basically can sense it what the light is in the in the actual structure. So therefore we're keeping you know the right lux levels and uniformity for health and safety point of view, but also trying to get this factor that we feel it's really comfortable like being an outside space. Uh, and, a, and a bespoke netting system, which means we, we can have lane practice and also we have game practice as well. So I think that the, the system up at Bradford, talking to the boys up there, that pre-Christmas, they've basically taken all, pull all the nets back and been playing games in there all the time. Uh, and they're playing games on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We've got videos of that and running around. And then the, the more sort of um, practice specific element of the, uh, the shields come in. So we're then pulling the lanes out and now the, the practice and the batting and the bowling is a bit more vigour in anticipation of the new season. So it gives us uh, a great area really to do any form of activity um, and training and games and obviously, you know, bespoke practice up to the elite level. Mm. Well, that sounds really interesting. It sounds like I need to get on the phone to my club chairman and, and make sure we get one of those in ourselves. Um, David, thanks so much for your time. We'll leave a link in our description to everything Total Play. Uh, a very quick run through of some of the major stories from the world game over the last week. So Babar Azam is back as Pakistan's T20i captain, 100 or so days after he resigned. Um, it's been pure chaos in Pakistan over the last week or so. Uh, Baba was re reappointed and in the statement announcing this, um, there were some quotes attributed to Shaheen Afridi. And then Shaheen Afridi then said, I, I never actually used those words. Um, I never said anything to you. Uh, Dan Senior uh, did an excellent video on our social feeds on that mess for anyone interested. Uh, England are 1-0 up in New Zealand in the ODI series there. Amy Jones played arguably the knock of her England career uh, to save England. They were 79 for six in the run chase. And then Jones and Charlie Dean put on 130 uh, unbeaten runs for the seventh wicket, which is a world record women's ODI seventh wicket stand to get England over the line. So an important knock for Jones, who's going through a bit of a barren run. Uh, and Sri Lanka beat Bangladesh 2-0 in Bangladesh, which is no mean feat. Uh, Kamindu Mendis, the bloke who bowls with both arms, mm. um, now has the most test runs of anyone ever after four innings. So equaled me and dad's record. Um, he's he's doing very well. Averages like 16 first class cricket. And Sri Lanka, whisper it, looking all right ahead of that England tour later in the summer. They got I, their I wickets saw, through saw... seam, not spin. So... You know, everyone's writing off that series as, oh, it'll be England 3-0. But Sri Lanka, actually, they've got a solid top seven mm. and they've got seamers who are doing pretty well. And Dan and Jaya's now, is he full-time captain now? I saw he was captaining. I'm not sure if he is or not. I don't know. Uh, caught me off guard there. But, but, sure. but, but he's getting runs. Dan and Jaya's getting runs. Well, um, well, he, so he captained the, the previous test match and and it, this was news to me. <laughs> 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 to be honest, I thought that Big Frank was still doing it up top. Big Frank uh, quit ahead of the, the new World Test Championship cycle. Gotcha. Okay. Um, always thinking the future is big, Frank. Um, and finally, let's head to Wizards in India editor Adi Sharma to hear about Mayank Yadav, the 97 mile per hour speedster who is taking the IPL by storm. Adia, every year the IPL throws up an exciting new face or two. But this year, we might have seen the most exciting new face the IPL has ever seen. I know that sounds like a big statement, but if you haven't seen Mayank Yadav yet, go and find the delivery to Cam Green yesterday. Adia, he's 21 years old. He's not played in the IPL before, and he's bowling 97 miles per hour. And I know there have been quick newbies in the IPL before, but no one has looked this ready for the top tier of cricket in any format, really, um, when they've joined the IPL. I watched him live last night, and it's so much fun to watch. Um, you're right. You're right. He seems so ready. Um, even two two matches, and you can see how how dramatically he's just like come into the IPL like a wrecking ball, and he's he's just been on the top of headlines. I think for me, one thing that really stands out for Mank is that he's bowling fast, but he's he's really bowling great lines. Generally, what you see with draw pace is they are a little wayward to start with. Um, 
you saw that with Umran Malik at the start of his career and that was an issue for him that he was um a bit up and down i know it's just been two matches but from what we've seen so far mayank yadav is more in control of his pace and that's something that really stands out hmm. and the manner in which he's easily hitting 150 that is for for indians who who on an appetite of 130 140 hmm Um, what's his story? How how's he only turn up now? How can someone who can bowl ninety seven miles per hour be be unheard of? It's not the time he's at one fifty, and it's not the first time he's at one fifty in a televised game also. Okay. Uh, it it happened last year, Syed Mushtaqali, where he hit one fifty five. Um, the thing with Mayank is that because he missed last IPL because of injury, he wasn't in the group of players you look forward to when when the season begins. His story is interesting. Um. he comes from the west of delhi which is virat kohli's land and um, he belongs to the sonnet cricket club that has given us rishabh pant and shikhar dhawan so he comes um, via the same coach the late tarik sena and um, he did not play under 14 under 16 for delhi directly played under 19 and he was obviously very fast even at that time he said that in interviews that he he claims in interviews that he was bowling 140 at the age of 17 um which is but, genuinely uh, believable if he if he's bowling 155 now that is believable yeah yeah but yeah i think his um, his progress from there from there on from under 19 in 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 delhi um it really took a, a massive leap when he was selected by lsg lucknow super giants um ahead of ipl 2022 So he had given trials for Delhi Capitals and Chennai Super Kings, and he was pretty confident. He said he was ninety percent confident that Chennai Super Kings will go for him in the auction, but they did not. So in the first round he was unsold, and then the in the in the last round, the accelerated round, he was picked up by LSG. Mm. And uh, very finally, he he's mentioned that uh, when he saw his name in that ticker go green, he didn't even check which team bought him. He just lay in bed for an hour and just prayed to God. did not see any messages any calls only an hour later he got to know which team he had been picked by <laughs> obviously there there've been other quick guys in the IPL before who haven't taken that next step so you mentioned one of them Umran Malik as uh, Kamlesh Narkoti Kartik Tyagi um let's almost go through them one by one to sort of say why Mayank is is different so Umran bowled genuinely rapid i think he touched 96 miles per hour in his first season but you're right he was a very different type of bowler he wasn't as accurate he was always wayward um and he also was much more slingy so i think that batters could sort of get underneath him quite easily if he got his lengths wrong my angle yeah. looks as quite a classical action in producing his his great speed so i mean genuinely the the person who who he reminds me of is Brett Lee in terms of it's very if you compare the two yeah. great fast bowlers of the early 2000s that the fast fast bowlers Schweb and Lee he is more Lee than Schweb uh, Schweb was quite slingy yeah. Brett yeah. Lee was very straight lines and Mayank is quite straight lines um and yeah. i guess Tiagi was bowling in the 90s not that long ago but he's undergone like a a change in action and he isn't quite as quick and, and Narcotti is not around anymore either yeah yeah no you're right that's obviously the big issue with uh, with with fast bowlers early in their careers and and i i agree that that's something that really stands out for mayank is how clean his action is it's so smooth you got you're almost surprised how he's touching 155 with that yeah. action with umran right you're right he 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 was sort of more jerky more slingy and um, i feel a bit more wayward he's played 10 odis for india 8 t20is so it's not like he just came and went he did play a, a certain number of games and you could see that he still he not finished enough not not ready enough to sort of you know stay for the longer for a long run and uh, that also becomes a challenge sometimes i feel with with quicks because they sometimes can do well in bursts but you don't see that consistency in them because of the nature of their of their art so uh, it gets very difficult to in a pool like india where you've got so many options to stick around with someone knowing that you might have you know another option around the corner mm. and um with nagar koti obviously it's been very unfortunate he's had back issues for a very long time credit to kolkata night riders for having retained him even when he was not fit but somehow he's just not been able to come back 
Hmm. Shivam Mavi has has been able to come back on and off, even made it to the India team last year. But again, with him, you can see that the same issue of the recurring injury, and and I think that is the case with Shivam Mavi's action also. I think that puts a bit of a load on his back. That that could keep coming back to haunt him. So it's it's always a very complicated thing with actions and fast bowlers, and you know the. I mean, it's the reason why we haven't seen him before, right? You know, he Mayank's had injury problems himself. And um, yeah. f- from an England point of view, if you look at some of the fastest bowlers England have produced in recent years, Ollie Stone has a test match bowling average of under uh, 20. He's only played three test matches. Um, he bowls when he's fit, quicker than 90 miles per hour consistently. Mark Wood level pace, but has barely played international cricket over the last few years. Joffre Archer touched the mid-90s when he burst on the scene in 2019, 2020, he's barely played international cricket since. And then you get examples like someone like Gus Atkinson, who he bowled, I would argue, a similar sort of spell to what Mayank did in the IPL in his first game in the 100 last year. He touched 95 miles per hour. And it wasn't just the speed gun that got you interested. It was who he was bowling to. Josh Butler and Phil Salt were, were, were jumping around. They It was clear that this guy was was rapid. And Atkinson has, has done well since. He's been involved in multiple England squads. But the reason why people probably don't talk about him in the same way as they did last summer is that he hasn't been able to maintain that pace. Yeah. He's occasionally bowled properly rapid, but he is not always properly rapid. And with Mayank, I guess we would say at this point, we just don't know if it's sustainable. We just don't know if he yeah. can continue to keep fit for a start. And if he stays fit, does he maintain that pace? Um, you'll know better than, than most people. With the way Indian cricket works, do you think it's, feasible that Mayank forces him his way into the T20 World Cup squad in a couple of months' time? can be the case, although I, I really um, hope that they don't rush him. Um, in a couple of years' time is a good time frame. Um, people have been chatting about adding him to the fast bowling contract that has just come up. So it's a group of bowling contracts that have been given for the first time in Indian cricket. Um, mm. And the five have been selected so far. And um, I think Ian Bishop yesterday tweeted that uh, my could be the sixth. Um, I think IPL has always been that that platform for players to be spotted and really, uh, in a way, fast tracked into the Indian team. And I'm really excited to see him actually make that leap because mm-hmm. he seems to be there. He's got what I feel that extra bit of bounce that really rushes into uh, you know that skilly pace is there. I, that's that's there in a lot of bowlers, but that extra bit of bounce that comes into his bowling. That adds another element to to his to his um, to his bowling. So that I think that's something I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I completely agree. I'd, I'd say the the biggest compliment I give to him is that as exciting as his pace is, he looks like he'd be a proper handful if he was ten kilometers per hour slower. I don't think he's someone who is reliant on his pace. Um, yep. Moving on to Mumbai Indians, they have started badly. Uh, they're they're none from three. Historically, one of the two heavyweight sides along along with. CSK. Um, we talked a little bit last week about the controversy of Hardik getting the captaincy over Rohit Sharma and the booze that surround it. Um, I thought initially it was uh, I didn't think, I didn't think that much of the booze, but they they really have continued in at Mumbai's first home game. There were a lot of booze as well. Um, yeah. They just seem like a bit of a mess at the moment. And from the outside, the other day there was an interesting moment where they were playing a game. And their number uh, three, I think, Naman, was out first ball. Then he was impact substituted out in the first over of the match for Jewel Brevis. Jewel Brevis became Mumbai's fourth overseas in the 11. And Jewel Brevis in the third over of the game was out first ball himself. So the two impact subs um, were had a combined naught from two for two dismissals. My reaction was, looking at that Mumbai Indians team, Mumbai have... Um, Tim David, Gerald Kutsia, who is very exciting, sure, and has done great things in ODI and Test cricket, but he's an inexperienced T20 bowler. Yeah. And the other two overseas players from Mumbai are Quenna Mapaka, who is the, uh, I think, the youngest ever, or the third youngest ever, sorry, uh, IPL overseas player, age 17. He had a great under 19 World Cup, but we know there's a big gap between that and the, the next level, really. And Jewel Brevis, who, again, had an amazing under 19 World Cup two years ago. And we've seen glimpses of what his obvious potential is. But I'm sort of like, how how is a team who's trying to be successful now 
in a competition that has mega auctions where you can only retain a handful of players? Why have they invested so much in so many young players? Yeah, I think um, related to the Rohit Sharma thing, Mark Boucher had said that this is sort of a, a transition phase that he understands for Mumbai Indians. Um, you can sense that a team that has been winning so consistently hasn't won anything since 2020, which is for them a big gap because they mm. ideally always win every other season. The captaincy change is one aspect, but I think they, they consider this year as a transitionary year um, because they are moving to towards a, a younger group of people. Obviously, in this squad itself, um, like you mentioned the bowling attack, uh, you mentioned that with Bumrah, they've got Kodze, they've got Mafaka. Um, I think their first two choices were... Um, I mean, they had Dilshan Madhushanka, who was injured and then withdrawn. Then they had Jason Berendorf, who was again injured and withdrawn. Or I think he just uh, pulled mm. himself. He was injured, yeah. Um, then they don't have Surya Kumar Yadav, who I feel brings a bit of consistency to a batting attack, batting lineup that's very hit and miss. Um, although they still have a great... I think they have, they have the best Indian batting core, arguably. It's very difficult to sort of pinpoint what the problem exactly has been. And we all know that Mumbai Indians always start sort of slow and then make a comeback mm. later in, into this into the season. Uh, there can be an argument to play, I guess, Luke Wood. I think Wood played in the first game. Mm. Um, in terms of other bowling options, I think one obvious um, sort of a point to discuss is Piyush Chavla being their, their uh, lead spinner, which mm. I know Chavla has had has been playing for years and years and he's got a great set of skills. But, you know, you need to have, if you're making a transition, you need to have a real transition. You need to have a real backup in place. Mm. So in that sense, there are a few gaps in their squad now. And that, I think, is in the first three games, you could see that playing in effect. Um, I don't think too much about the captaincy change because, um, you know, they did eventually choose someone like a Hardik Pandya who did take Gujarat Titans to two finals and one one title. And, uh, you know, it, eventually it's just the Rohit Sharma fan base that isn't, isn't happy with, with the change. And I feel any player who would have replaced Rohit Sharma would have, would have uh, received that sort of a, a backlash. Maybe not to the extent Hardik has because Hardik generally has received such uh, such criticism. Uh, I still feel that they have, uh, even with these gaps, they have got a great lineup. I still feel that they can make a comeback like they always do. They've surprised us on again and again and again. Uh, you know, it's it's incredible. You just look at the squad. You've got Rohit Sharma, you've got Ishan Kishan. Uh, Tim David Tilak Varma was like a sensation a year or two ago. And he still can bat. You can see it. Uh, you know, as an option, if you if you need to bring another spin option, as an overseas option, you've got Mohammad Nabi. In the bowling attack also, you've got like Bumra, Madhwal, Akash Madhwal did so well last year. Um, you know, Kodzi, Mafaka. I think it's just about hitting the strides and I think they'll do it very soon. Hmm. Well, I've really enjoyed watching the IPL from afar. Uh, cheers, Adia. We'll, we'll be in touch next week. That is everything for today. Thanks so much for sticking with us. Uh, cheers, Phil. And thanks, Ben, for coming in. Um, listeners, remember to get your hands on Ben's book and book those tickets for the live show. Links for both will be in the podcast description.